much for coming out today. It's truly a pleasure um, to be here, and it's also a pleasure to be here with Celery, who is a, such a dynamic designer. And also, she has a, a great book um, that is, is available outside that um, is, is just a, such a fun and easy read um, for designers, for, for non-designers, for anyone, because it really brings home the points that you need to do to convey a great room. For instance, uh, this, this photo ended up being used as the cover of my book because I found it represented one of the, the most challenging rooms to design, which is sort of an entry hall. It's usually a very small space, but it's meant to have a real impact upon both the people who live in the house and come in and out of it every day, as well as guests. But you're not offered much to work with because there isn't much upholstery. There often aren't windows. Um, you really, this is where working as an interior designer and talking either with the architect or the builder at the front end of the job gives you great power to, you know, from start to finish, create a space you want. So here we were trying to find a way to make it casual but have a strong impact, and we chose to do wood and limestone floors um, and to lay the limestone inset in the wood to keep it beachy but to give it that sort of formal entryway pattern. And really, you don't, you don't have much. You have a mirror, you have a window, you have, in this, play, in, in this instance, what, what I call temporary art. Um, we had to put something up, but I try not to influence my clients' art decision or push them to make their purchases before the sort of schedule of our job, which usually takes about a year, because that's, that's too tight a time frame, and often they don't have the budget to do everything all at once, and I like them to choose art that's meaningful to them. So I'm always looking for um, something that works, that holds it and doesn't leave it looking unfinished, but this hallway um, will change over time as the owners grow into their house. There was an interesting anecdote that uh, we were sharing earlier about how you actually got this shot for the book. It was something that was pretty interesting to me as a magazine editor because obviously when we go out and scout a location and do a photo shoot, we take hundreds of pictures of the same thing. Why don't you uh, tell everyone about kind of how you got this shot unexpectedly? Well, this was after four months. The hardest part of this book, other than the actual writing, um, was the time put in going to visit all the jobs I had done over the past 10 years and really invading my clients' lives, propping their houses, pulling out the hideous things <laughs> that they had put in, you know, borrowing antiques even from antique stores. Not, when you look at a book or in a magazine, there is always 15% of styling that happens just for that shoot. So to be doing that each time, traveling around with my photographer who became like my second husband, um, I lived with him for six months on this. This was absolutely the last shot, the last day of photography as we were walking out the door, which the camera is positioned in. And I said, oh my gosh, we never took a picture of the entry. Can we? And he just said, I need a beer so badly. <laughs> we're done. This is over. Last shot taken. We're out. There's the car. You know, his assistant was loading the equipment. And I was like, please. So he took two pictures. You know, normally they're at least 12 to 25 at different exposures. He like propped the camera up and was like, all right, beer. <laughs> and it ended up being the cover of the book. Great. Um, which it t tormented him. He, you know, there were other pictures we spent. <laughs> he probably didn't even want to show you that picture. Days propping and shooting. Yeah. And then for whatever reason, it just didn't was that fall picture. in the right layout and didn't go in the book. So. Sometimes the unexpected again has a habit of uh, catching up with you. <laughs> now this space is very, very dark, um, and it appears to be a pretty small space. Correct. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, this is, I think, a great picture to illustrate how the client leads. Right. The job. I'm known for very feminine, colorful, maybe more fashion oriented or slightly traditional spaces because that's what the editors tend to call upon me mm -hmm. to show. And this was an apartment in New York City where the parents asked me to design a room in one meeting with their uh, 19 year old son. And they said, This is his room. He's rarely going to be in it because he's going off to college. So we have to be able to use it as a guest room. But for whatever reason, he's, you know, he needs to feel that he selected everything or we're never going to hear the end of it. So 
take his, take his needs, take his wants to heart and generate a room that he's going to design. I sat down with him and I said, so what, what are you interested in? He said, I want a shagadelic room. I want, he's like, I like black, I like metal, I'm feeling Austin Powers. I was just like, this is, there's got to be a camera here somewhere because this is a joke. <laughs> and anyway, this was our attempt to create a room that was, and I was very happy with it in the end, that was tasteful but still counted as shagadelic. Um, I, Whatever that means. I, I, mean. <laughs> I don't know. We, we took um, a almost black, sort of a charcoal uh, faux leather, which is one of my absolute favorite uh, design materials now. I'm, you'll, you'll hear me wonk, wonk, wonk about faux leather because I'm a little addicted. Um, and upholstered the walls in, I think it was 11 by 23 inch vertical bricks because it was a small room. So we had to just make it a sort of a jewelry box. Every surface had to have something special. And uh, went to the vintage store and upholstered. I found two little chairs, covered them in the same material as the wall. And our bed was made out of a hammered uh, silver mystery metal. I still don't know what it was. But, um, you know, and we made these tiny, tiny bedside tables that are like 15 inches. This is the hardest piece of furniture to find in our, I, our small bedside tables. Um, I, I would assume. I mean, Las Vegas, you guys have so much space to work with, but you're still dealing with sort of condominium floor prints. So a lot of times the second bedroom will have a closet right next to the bed. And if you open the door, you're going to be whacking into the bed or the bedside table. So um, I often have to custom make teeny, teeny bedside tables. So here we did them in um, inlaid metal and black lacquer. But um, this is just to show how, you know, as, as designers, we're translators even for ourselves. You know, everything you're doing um, for the client and learning as, as I go a, a completely new vocabulary. This room is, well, it's beautiful, but one thing I noticed about this room was that there's no two things that are really the same or that really go together. So I think this is an excellent example of how you can really build around something. And the interesting thing, obviously, is that that's a record collection on the bottom, correct? It is. I, I, I find every client has some weird quirk or something that's sacred to them. And I like to start the job sort of calling that elephant out and saying, OK, what, what are you going to hit me with? What do I have to do? Or what, what ugly chair does your husband have to keep? Um, and in this, they said, well, we have this record collection that's really important to us. And we'd like to showcase it. I don't think they actually listen to them. Um, but records are complicated because they're, you know, by the time you build something to house it, it's, it's got almost a 24-inch depth. So a bookcase doesn't quite cut it. And short of maybe shellacking the walls and putting the cases and the sleeves and using them as wallpaper, I didn't know what to do. So we built a banquette niche because this, that was appropriate for a seat depth. And um, as soon as we had all the records lined up, I noticed were beautiful newsprint colors, mm -hmm. what, what came together with all those sort of blacks and creams and little shots of color, which always seemed to be yellow, orange, or red. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why, but you know, over a couple hundred records, that was all we noticed. So we, we painted the, uh, the walls behind the niche charcoal and found a fabric, I can't remember who makes it, that was a, um, it wasn't cut velvet and it wasn't chenille, but it had all those colors. See the just texture. Almost see the, you see the texture of the stripes and worked with the, the pop of color and uh, reinforced it in one throw pillow and a piece of art. And I think it really came together.